Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gemma. I was saying that we are glad to have with, with us uh, today uh, Dr. Jonathan Dawson from the University of Southampton, who is going to talk about uh, clay uh, nanoparticles for tissue engineering and biomaterials uh, design. But uh, after the introduction, that is, it will be handled by May. Uh, I will make a couple of uh, reminders. The session, uh, as Hema already said, is going to be recorded. And uh, I will have a, also a remind you that uh, the happy hour, it's going to be the November 27th. And, uh, and the research group, uh, uh, which uh, who are going to uh, talk are uh, neuroverd uh, analytical chemistry canap and and cardio uh, cardio and metabolic diseases so may um, go ahead and make the introduction of john thanks uh, again john uh, to be with us and go, go on may hello Good afternoon in Spain and um, good morning in Southampton and UK. Uh, it's my real pleasure to uh, present John today because he actually is the first friend I made in the UK when I moved there. And we share so many uh, experiments and hours in the lab and even more coffees, although you cannot believe. Um, uh, he's a uh, excellent scientist, as you will see, um, very good communicator. I promise you are going to enjoy the, this talk. Um, just to tell you that John uh, is a PI of the Nanoclay Group at the University of Southampton in England, uh, where he's developing uh, his research on the application of clay nanoparticles in, gener in regenerative medicine. Uh, he has a EPSRC Early Career Research Fellowship, and in 2010, he won the Engineering Award for his collaboration with industry and clinicians to develop a method of concentrating bone marrow stem cells. Also, he's the author of three patents, a co-founder of the company Renovos Biologic with Richard Orefor, our mentor, um, that is a spin-off of the University of Southampton, expert in bone gener regeneration. Um, as well, John uh, designed with the Winchester Science Center uh, the stem cell mountain. That thanks to that we all of us uh, learn what is public engagement. And now I give my word to John, and thank you again for uh, being with us today, John. Oh, thanks so much, my thank you, uh, Professor Gonzalez, and for him as well for inviting me. Um, it's really great to be able to speak um, at your institution. I'm so, I'm a bit disappointed that I couldn't be here there in person. We rather optimistically planned this event in November, just in case um, I'd be able to get there, but unfortunately it's not worked out. Um, I'm gonna be sharing my slides. I just want to let you know that, um, as has been lots of people's experience through this time, I'm working from home and there is a small possibility that my youngest daughter may pop in at some point, just so you know, but I'll, um, I've, I've tried to um, persuade her not to come in on this, on this meeting. Okay, let me um, share my slides. Great, so thank you again for this opportunity to share some of our work here in Southampton with you. Um, my work has um, focused mainly for my, my entire career really on a very interesting clay material um, and I'm going to just really try and persuade you that clay is more interesting than you might imagine and has more possibilities in biology and medicine um, than you might have supposed. A bit of an introduction into clay first of all. Sometimes um, use this slide just to give an indication of some of the interesting properties of clay. Uh, mud bath, toothpaste, diarrhea and the origin of life. Well, they all have um, something to do with the properties of clay. It's, of course, clay that is thought to give mud baths their very useful properties, um, their cleansing properties, their ability to absorb 
toxins and, and bacteria from the skin. It's that it's the clay element of a mud bath that's thought to impart those properties. Um, clays are used in, very widely as rheology modifiers in um, a whole load of different applications from paint to cosmetics to toothpaste. Uh, the, 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 the ability of clay particles to interact with themselves and quite dramatically change the viscoelastic properties of various solutions, the gelation properties um, is widely used in industry. Well, diarrhea, um, so clays have for a long time been used as a rather homeopathic treatment um, of, of diarrhea. I won't go into the details of how they work, uh, but what's interesting is that uh, back in the 1960s, clinicians found that if you co-administered uh, other drugs such as antidepressants alongside um, the, the use of these uh, clay-based um, antacids or clay-based diarrheal treatments, what they found is that the function of the drug and the activity of the drug was dramatically reduced. And they discovered that it was basically because the clay particles themselves were absorbing the drug onto the surface um, and the drug was passing through the gut without having any effects on the patient. And that led to their investigations as drug release modifiers. And that's that's a really key element of, of a lot of our research. The origin of life, well, biology at its most speculative has proposed that clay particles are what provided the catalytic surface required for the polymerization of nucleotides and the uh, emergence of the very first RNA-based life forms in the primordial soup. Um, so I don't know what you think about that, but I think these things give you an indication that clay has some very interesting properties, especially their gelation properties and especially their ability to bind and interact with proteins and nucleotides. And really, that's at the core of a lot of our research that we do in our research group. Our broad area and focus in research is the very interesting, exciting area of regenerative medicine. Uh, regenerative medicine, as I'm sure you're aware, is basically the attempt to harness the potential of stem cells to regenerate new tissue. Um, this term tissue engineering encompasses quite a broad range of strategies, but the kind of unifying themes of this field are first of all, the attempt to isolate or enrich um, stem cells from the body, perhaps involving um, reprogramming of autologous cells or the use of allogeneic cells, um, their expansion out of the body, and sometimes um, the use of various bioengineering approaches to try and start to assemble um, initial tissues, which are then um, delivered back into the body in the hope that they graft, um, start to produce extracellular matrix, uh, a process which is very commonly um, stimulated and induced by the co-administration of uh, growth factors and other biochemical signals that try and direct these cells um, in the body. Our approach focuses uh, most sp uh, specifically on this latter aspect. So we're really interested, especially in using this combination of a conducive matrix with biochemical signals to recruit endogenous populations and try and um, reinitiate, enhance uh, regenerative sponsors that are stalled because of various injury and disease states. And our particular focus has been in bone, but we've also done a lot of work in, in skin um, regeneration more recently as well. And our interest is in whether we can use clay particularly as a way of, um, of controlling and enhancing this process. We're certainly not the first to begin looking at clays in um, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Uh, back in 2013, we did a quite an extensive review of the topic, and um, we found uh, at that time about 100 uh, publications working in this area. Um, this review itself has now been cited um, about 150, 200 times, uh, which indicates that this is definitely a great area. More and more people are working um, in this topic. The initial work focused on the interaction of clay particles with polymers. Um, in the 1980s, Toyota Company uh, started using clay, nanoclay particles as a dispersed phase within a polymeric matrix and plastics. 
and they found that using these clay particles um, dramatically improved both mechanical properties but also the thermostability of these of these um, materials. Um, it's what's given rise to, exa for example, to those um, sweet pouches that we're very familiar with now that are able to stand up. So these kind of stiffer plastics owe a lot to the invention of polymer clay nanocomposites. Essentially what happens in this context is that the, the, the um, clay particles themselves function as this very large surface area which can provide cross-linking sites for the polymers. And so the polymers will stick to this surface um, and they'll form more, multiple points of connection with this uh, flat clay particle surface um, and that adds a lot of toughness and stiffness to the polymer. Well, people saw the potential there and started to apply these uh, polymer clay nanocomposites in um, biological contexts and started to use clays in conjunction with biomedical polymers and to see whether we could get similar enhancements to properties. While doing that, people also started to realize um, that the clay particles themselves can affect the cell response directly. So people found that if you add clay particles into these polymers, you get much improved cell adhesion to the polymers. Often these polymers are often very hydrophilic, especially if they're gels. Uh, by, by adding the particles, uh, proteins bind and you can improve cell adhesion and other cell responses were, were explored as well. And finally, um, the, the, the avenue I've already mentioned in terms of the use of clays in drug delivery. Other people have started looking at whether clay interactions with proteins can be used to modify the release from these polymers. And that's a really core aspect of what we've been focusing on. So let me tell you a bit more about clay itself. Clays are um, essentially a layered silicate material characterized typically by a octahedral metal ion sheet sandwiched normally between um, two tetrahedral silica sheets. The different forms and types of clay are largely characterized by the charge structure of the sheets themselves. Some charges are quite strong and so the particles start to stack and they form very large uh, particles. That's that's the case in kaolinite and, and tulk, um, types of clays we're very familiar with. Other clays, like the smectites, um, have a weaker charge structure, uh, which means that these clays are able to delaminate completely and form these very, very thin uh, clay particles. In the case of montmorillonite, these particles are quite large, um, have large diameters. In the case of other synthetic particles, like laponite, which is our clay of choice, the particle size is much, much smaller. Um, so the crystals are about 25 nanometers across and one nanometer thick. So in the case of laponite, this gives rise to these particles with a negative surface charge, permanent negative surface charge, and then this uh, pH dependent positive rim charge um, around this one nanometer thick particle. And these quite simple properties in some ways give a rise to a whole range of different types of interaction. Uh, not least uh, um, within, within themselves. So the way these particles function when they're dispersed in water as a colloid is itself a very, very interesting and complex phenomena. And there's all kinds of papers describing um, the dynamics of these interactions just when you add this clay into water. We tend to use these clays at rather high concentrations, so maybe three, two or three percent um, of the total um, weight mass of the, of the solution. And that, in that case, the clay particles form these gel-like materials, uh, which you can see illustrated in these vid videos. Um, so on the left, you can see that these clay particles are able to be injected and upon extrusion from the needle, they form this gel material. Also, they're very, very responsive to saline. Now, what's happening is actually very um, interesting. Oh, sorry, this, this graph just illustrates the responsiveness of these of these materials. So if you um, apply this gel here, this is a gel on a rheometer. So this is a, a spindle that measures the, um, the, the, the essentially the stiffness of the material by gradually oscillating on the material and measuring the resistance to the oscillation. Um, this graph here plots what's called the elastic modulus and the loss modulus of this material. So in the case of the elastic modulus, this is the amount of this could be translated roughly as, as the stiffness of the material. And in its native state, it already has a stiffness. It's able to retain its shape. 
and it behaves very much like a gel. But when you add it into a solution of, for example, a physiological saline or a blood serum, you see a very dramatic increase in the stiffness of this material. And that's a very useful property. It means that this is both an injectable material, but also a material that when you inject into the body, it stiffens and forms a, a stable gel. So what's happening here, and I'm just going to explain this because it is it is an interesting phenomena. When you in this native state, um, the gel is actually not a gel at all. The the particles are not interacting with each other and forming a continuous network through the solution. Rather, the clay particles are repelling each other, uh, and so as they get to a certain concentration in the solution, these mutual repulsions mean that the clay particles themselves jam. And it's that that locks the water in place and gives these gel-like properties to the solution. It's the reason as well that this material is, is able to be injected, because as you apply shear to it, these um, particles rearrange and the solution can move. And then as soon as you remove the shear, they jam again and the, and the solution locks in place. It looks like a gel, behaves like a gel. Actually, um, it's, it's to do with these repulsive interactions between the particles. Now, when you add salt, or protein to this, um, if you mix it in, what you find is that these negative charges here that repel each other are shielded and the um, and the particles start to become closer together and then they start to form these edge to face interactions um, and even start sticking together at, at higher salt concentrations. And so you get these aggregations of particles forming. And if you mix them in um, uniformly through the solution, you get a phase separation where these particles become more and more densely aggregated and start to sink to the bottom and separate out from the solution. But we use it in a slightly different way. When you inject it as an arrested state into blood, for example, um, when the ions and proteins from the blood start to diffuse in, rather than getting this, um, this phase separation, you instead get these very, very stable diffusion gels forming. These gels remain transparent as the particles gradually um, or progressively interlock with each other as the iron solution or the protein solution increases and you get these very stable um, transparent gels forming. And that's that's a very interesting uh, phenomena and provides all kinds of useful applications which we're trying to explore and harness. And I'm going to give you some more indications of that later on in the talk. Um, so in summary, these are nanoclay diffusion gels. You inject them in the body. The particles behave like a gel initially, but it's a reversible gel, a gel you can inject. Uh, upon contact with blood serum, the particles start to rearrange, form interactions with each other, and form these um, stable gels, which actually incorporate the blood proteins into the structure. And you can see the very dramatic change in the properties of the gel upon injection into, into blood serum here. It goes from being this very um, particular type material to being a much more fibrous material, a bit a much more like normal cellular matrix. So we've found that these nanoclay um, gels are able to sustain cell adhesion in and of themselves. So you can grow cells on top of them. The felt cells form contacts mainly because of the protein incorporated within their structures. And you can also encapsulate cells within these gels and the cells are able to function and start to lay down matrix. Here's some of the histology we've done um, after growing these cells in normal osteogenic media. And you see that over time, over the course of three weeks, the cells progressively start to lay down type 1 collagen, express uh, lungs 2, and, um, and, and start to form mineral with, 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 the, with, the role, with osteocalcin showing up as well. Um, in this case, the smaller images here just highlight the amount of tissue that we're able to generate is a much larger volume of tissue compared to the very dense um, micromass cultures that we were using as a control in this case. So this is an in vitro study basically showing that the potential of these gels to encapsulate cells to allow them to function as bone cells. Now, oh, and sorry, here's some um, SEM again showing this progressive mineralization of this tissue. So Initially, that's the gel in its native state, um, gels at day one with the cells incorporated. And then over the course of three weeks, you see this very clear indication of progressive mineralization of this gel material. And um, the result increases in the calcium phosphate uh, peaks uh, via EDX. Uh, 
Now, um, there's a lot of work exploring the direct osteogenic effects of clay. Here I've shown you essentially that the gels themselves are able to sustain um, bone uh, osteogenesis within these gel structures. Um, but as well as that, uh, several other groups have found quite an interesting thing that the clay particles themselves seem to induce osteogenic activity in the cells. And we've spent a, a good bit of time in the last couple of years trying to explore and understand this. Um, probably the person who's done the most work in this area is a chap called Akhlesh Gahawa um, out of uh, Texas. And he's found very simply that if you add uh, these particles at much lower concentrations, these are at uh, microgram concentrations to cell culture media, you very reproducibly get an upregulation in alkaline phosphatase activity and the formulation, formation of mineralized matrix. Uh, he's done an extensive uh, bit of work looking at um, differentially expressed genes using a transcriptomics approach and found that there was widespread upregulation of a whole range of different genes. Um, these uh, particles themselves were found to co-localize with lysosome. Um, so the cells seem to uptake the particles. And so the assumed mechanism that's um, normally used to explain this is that the cells take up the particles, they degrade the particles within the lysosome, and the release of osteogenic ions such as silicon or magnesium or lithium um, are really what gives the clays these, this osteogenic activity. Um, and so this is the, the, the model that's often employed. So we've uh, done a bit of work to try and explore um, whether this, uh, whether the clay particles themselves do um, induce osteogenic effects directly, uh, which is an interesting question, but also it, we began looking into the mechanism for this and testing this hypothesis of uh, cell mediated degradation, release of ions and upregulation of osteogenic genes and release in, in response to the release of the, the clay ions. Um, so um, are these confirmed that these clay particles when applied in this way are biocompatible? Um, so when you just add clay as a dispersion to subculture media, the cells tolerate it well. The clay particles very quickly start to interact uh, with the cells. And similarly, we found, again, a very dramatic upregulation, particularly of alkaline phosphatase and of um, mineralization activity, both at the protein level um, and at the gene level. This is a very, very reproducible result, which we see very consistently. Uh, so even after day three, when you apply clay to human bone marrow stromal cells in culture, you see this strong upregulation of alkaline phosphatase activity as a direct response to clay and then a very dramatic effect on mineralization, uh, where you start to see these calcified nodules forming in these human bone marrow cultures um, after day 14, which is a very early uh, time point to see these, these mineralized nodules in, especially in human cells. So this um, seems to validate some of this work in the literature. Um, although when we've looked at other genes, the picture seems to be more complex. Though so collagen one is again, fairly consistently upregulated Lots of other genes you associate with the traditional osteogenic pathways, such as RUNX2 and Osterix, you don't see upregulated. You don't see any effects often in these um, osteogenic specific transcription factors. So that um, suggests that there may be something else going on here. We find that the um, clay particles are very rapidly internalized by the cells. And in fact, they begin to accumulate in the cells over time. Um, uh, so after seven days, over, over the course of seven days, you see progressive accumulation of the clay particles in the cells. Um, also, when we've done some TM work, we found that the clay particles seem to be degraded within the cells themselves. So um, here you see some TM Im images uh, at an early, fairly early time points at day three. Um, and you can see just by looking at the cross section of these cells various stages of the nanoclay interacting with the cells. Um, so here you see the typical membrane invaginations of endocytosis. This is a region of extracellular clay here. And when you see, look at it at high power, you can see these um, dense rod shapes, which is characteristic of, of what laconite looks like um, under TEM. Although they're spherical, you can only really see them in cross section on TEM. Uh, these particles become internalized by the cells. Um, they locate within the endosome, within the cells. And then as you track the formation of 
um, lysosome. What's quite interesting here is when you look at high power at the more mature lysosomes, you can still see peaks of magnesium and silicon indicating that there's clay within these lysosomes, but the particles themselves are much, much smaller. So the particles seem to be being processed and broken down um, by the cells. There's some indication as well of exocytosis by TM, uh, but this is something that we're trying to confirm currently. But indi early indications suggest that the clay particles are internalized and they are indeed degraded and broken down um, by the cells. Another important feature, though, of this whole system is that the amount of clay, the total amount of clay is very, very small compared, the, the amount of clay internalized is very, very small compared to the total amount of clay um, that's free in the supernatant. So when we try and characterize these different fractions of clay in the supernatant, clay bound to the cell surfaces and clay internalized, we found that actually a very, very small fraction of the clay is actually internalized within these cells, even though you tend to see a quite a strong dose response of clay. So again, that suggests that it's a little bit more complicated than simple accumulation of clay in the cells, given that the fraction internalized is so small. Um, here's just a, an indication of that using a pie chart. We also found that blocking endocytosis um, doesn't really restrict the osteogenic effects of the, um, the clay. So here, chloropromazine was used to inhibit endocytosis. We found that with the inhibitor, you did indeed see much less um, endocytosis of the clay particles in the cells. Um, but what we didn't see was an equivalent fold change in the osteogenic effects in this clear effect on alkali phosphatase activity with the inhibitor. So although the clay seems to be inducing osteogenic effect, it doesn't seem to be down to the endocytosis of the clay uh, by the cells. Finally, we look directly at the degradation products of the clay. So again, here you see, this is again alkali phosphatase activity, a very clear dose effect of clay um, on the alkali phosphatase activity. Uh, but when you take the equivalent concentrations of the different iron, silicon, magnesium, and lithium uh, present in clay, again, you don't see really that same dramatic um, osteogenic effect. So that's really as far as we've got with this question. Um, we don't really understand why the clays are exerting this um, apparent osteogenic effect on cells, but it doesn't seem to be due to clay uptake and degradation within the cell and the release of ions. But that's an ongoing story. And that's just a slide summarizing this really to say that there's probably other biophysical effects of the clay on the cells. OK. I'm going to move on because our main focus in much of our research has been less to do with direct effects of clays on the cells and more the use of these clay gel environments as a way of delivering growth factors. There's a very rich array of possible interactions by which a protein might interact with clay particles. It can become bound within interlayer sites within stacked clay particles. It can get locked via hydrophobic interactions or van der Waals interactions simply between um, clusters of clay particles. And then, of course, there's um, the large surface area available for cation exchange and the presence of these positively charged edge sites for, for protein binding as well. Our early studies found that when you mix in protein into these gel capsules and add them to the media, compared to a typical hydrogel release profile, and this is illustrated here, with alginate and other ionic gel. Um, here, looking at albumin, a large negatively charged protein, and lysozyme, a small positively charged protein, we find that in both cases, you see a burst release of this protein from these, these alginate gels at equivalent concentrations. Whereas with laponite, when you mix in these uh, proteins, you don't see any release at all over that entire time frame. And instead, what you see when you um, have your protein rather than being in the in the gel, but in the solution, and then add the protein into that. Uh, sorry, add the, the clay gel into that pro into that protein solution. You see a very dramatic loss of uh, protein from the solution as it's absorbed um, onto the surface of the clay gel. Again, with alginate, you see a degree of interaction between um, the positively charged lysozyme and the negatively charged lys alginate. Uh, but in the case of Laponite, you get this broad spectrum absorptive potential 
where these proteins um, very quickly bind up to quite high concentrations. So this graph shows basically the amount of protein is almost equivalent by mass to the solid content of, of laponite in the system. Uh, this is just labeling the protein and showing that the uh, protein is first of all retained within the gel itself. Um, and when you have the protein in the solution labeled, you see that in this setup here, the protein becomes bind initially to the periphery of the gel capsule. And the amount of absorbed protein here is equivalent to about fourfold the ambient protein concentration in the solution. So this shows that there's a very, very high affinity of these two very different proteins to clay. And a lot of our work has been done, is spent um, trying to explore how we can use this uh, broad spectrum protein binding activity in the use for, for the purposes of regenerative medicine. Uh, our initial work looked at the activity of VEGF, VGF, uh, angiogenic inducing molecule um, in clay. So we used a um, HUVEC tubule assay. We found that we could uh, create a gel of laponite and seed cells on top of them. And if you add in fibronectin into the laponite, you get these nice stable um, tubule kind of um, endothelial uh, vascular precursors, uh, a tubular network um, in response to VEGF um, on laponite. Uh, so then we looked to see whether the laponite bound VEGF and whether the VEGF retained its activity when bound to laponite. And we found essentially that the bound fraction of VEGF on the laponite was as active as the that present when added into the media, providing strong evidence that the VGF protein binds to laponite and it remains active when associated with laponite. Uh, we took this in vivo. Uh, this just again shows the very easy ability to inject laponite under the skin um, and gels form uh, very rapidly and those gels are preserved over the course of the time frame. Here we compared um, laponite uh, with its ability to bind VGF with our alginate gel of equivalent viscosity, which doesn't have the same capacity to bind VGF, um, and so releases VGF to see whether there's a difference in the angiogenic effects of these two uh, materials based on their binding ability. Um, and we found there was. So with alginate, you can see, uh, especially um, peripheral to the location of the gel, a slight increase in vascularization around the gel Whereas with laponite, you see a strong dose response to the VGF um, injected with the laponite. And um, more dramatically, the presence of blood vessels invading into the gel itself as, as the VGF is retained within the gel. So you see a much stronger and a much more localized angiogenic response with the use of these clay gels which bind VGF. Um, and this is the histology of the gels themselves to show, again, the um, increase in um, in angiogenesis. This is a, a VWF staining of endothelial cells within the gel. And again, a clear dose response to the, the VGF uh, delivered. The other, and probably the, the thing we spent most of our time focusing in, is the molecule BMP2. Now this deserves a bit of background because this is a really core aspect of our research program. BMP2 is one of the most potent inducers of bone we know. If you inject uh, BMP2 into your muscle, it will transform your muscle into bone tissue. It's a very, very powerful molecule. Um, it's also clinically licensed for use in um, lumbar, lumbar spine fusion and in tibial fracture repair. And it's very, it's still very widely used, despite the fact that there's some very significant limitations to its use due to some quite dangerous side effects, especially in the context of the spine. Um, so very often with use of BMP2, you see heterotopic bone formation, um, you see, can see swelling, and you can see over time osteolysis uh, following its use. Um, but despite this, surgeons still love using it because it's probably one of the most reliable ways that we have of stimulating new bone formation where bone wouldn't normally form, which is key, especially in, in spinal fusion applications. Uh, the limitations are mainly attributed to the poor ability of the carrier used to both localize BMP2 and to achieve bone formation reliably at 
uh, anything approaching physiological concentrations of BMP2. So um, the amount, the con concentrations of BMP2 used are extremely high milligram quantities um, to reduce reliable bone formation. And, and really that's what you can attribute these side effects to, both the high concentration required and the limitations or in terms of the ability to retain and localize BMP2. So this is really a very promising application for clay gels and the, the ability of clay to bind BMP2 lens seems to lend itself very naturally to this application. Our early studies showed that this, um, this is a, a C2C12, a myoblast cell res dose response to BMP2 in the form of an alkaline phosphatase activity expression. Um, we found that if you pre-incubate our um, the solutions with the clay gel for only 30 minutes, you can completely knock out this um, dose response to cells when you apply the supernatant back to the cells again. So that indicates that the BMPQ does indeed bind to um, the clay gel. And we subsequently found that if you um, place a spot of clay gel onto a tissue culture surface and then apply the cells and the BMP2 to the, cell, to the cells at the same time, you both see a significant upregulation in the activity of BMP2, but also you see a very striking localization of that activity so that only cells directly in contact with the clay gel seem to respond to the BMP2. And really, um, this increased uh, EC50 of the activity of, of uh, BMP2 can largely be attributed to this concentrating effect of the BMP2 on, on the clay gel surface. Um, so we then sought to see if we could translate that in vivo, and our focus here was really on trying to reduce the effective dose of BMP2. Remember, the issue of BMP2 is the very high concentrations used, so if you can achieve equivalent efficacy at much lower doses, that's a real bonus. Um, so to look at the doses, we did quite an extensive literature review of all of the different doses of BMP2 tested in the particular model we were looking at. Um, and this model is the this subcutaneous implant, which, is, which with BMP2 induces ectopic bone formation. Um, and we found that um, looking at around 70 studies, um, the, this, this graph here plots in the black, the effective doses in the white, the ineffective doses tested, and the blue spots all the way up here are the clinically used um, concentrations. The uh, y-axis here is um, the um, concentration of BMP2 used. The, the x-axis is the total amount of BMP2 delivered. And we found initially that, first of all, there was a very narrow window, really, um, within which a BMP2 delivery vehicle actually seems to improve the situation. You either get a positive dose or effective dose based on um, the concentration. The carrier doesn't seem to play much of an effect. Um, but we looked at two doses. We looked at one at the lower end of this range and then one at what we estimated to be around physiological, um, a physiological dose. By that, we mean the amount of BMP2 you need to actually exert an effect on cells when you apply the molecule directly to cells in, in, in a cell culture environment, for example. And we again compared it with our alginate control. Um, and the results showed that um, at that lower, at the, um, at the 500 nanogram dose, so the dose at the lower end of the typical uh, efficacy window, um, alginate was indeed able to induce ectopic bone quite reliably, um, so too could clay gel, uh, but only the laponite gels were able to induce uh, bone induction at the very, very low doses of 40 nanograms that, you, that we call physiological. So that's again a very strong indication that the clay gel is able to improve the efficacy of BMP2. Um, we found that this uh, dose effect um, is directly dependent on the concentration of the gel in the system um, and this really this histology here just indicates the type of result we get after about eight weeks where you get these ectopic bone nodules forming um, and um, within the bone, it's quite striking that there's actually very little residual clay remaining over this time frame. So these very light blue stained regions here are where the, the, the residual clay gel is, but most of it's been remodeled into new bone tissue. So uh, this is a, a summary slide, so I'll skip through that. Um, 
we wanted to see if we could attribute the BMP2 activity specifically to the localization effect, which is what we think um, is, is where we think the advantage is. Um, so we labeled BMP2 and then we looked at the distribution of BMP2 concurrent with bone formation um, over a longer time frame. So again, we injected the gel under the subcutaneously um, and then we measured via IVIS to look at the label protein and micro CT to look at the bone formation over time. And then we also um, looked as well at the presence of clay um, in the subcutaneous site using uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to measure um, the lithium and, mag and, and silica ions uh, present at the site following implantation. Uh, the BMP2 labeling confirmed that, um, well, we confirmed that we were able to label the BMP2, and importantly, the BMP2 retained about 50% of its activity following labeling. So we used that to um, calculate the concentrations we were going to be delivering. And the results showed that when you eject BMP2 as a bolus, not surprisingly, the BMP2 dissipates very, very quickly indeed. Um, but when you deliver it with BMP with the nanoclay, we find that the BMP2 is still detectable even after eight weeks um, following implantation, which is a very remarkable uh, for, for, a, for a quite an unstable protein like BMP2. Um, and that time frame correlated nicely with um, the formation of bone over that time. And again, here you can see that the laying down of bone um, which seems to be templated very precisely by the actual dimensions of the gel that you can see here in the faint, um, the faint, the faint detection via micro CT. Uh, when we look at the implant staff itself by histology, you can see this progressive invasion of cells um, into the gel matrix. Uh, we're currently doing a lot of work trying to ex understand the the intervening role of macrophage in this process, but certainly when you label the clay itself and then look at the cells invading, you can start to see the cells are disassembling the gel by endocytosing the clay um, and then removing it from the site. And based on what we've seen with the human bone marrow cells, we suspect the cells are themselves degrading the clay particles at the site. And really, this is confirmed by the um, inductive coupled plasma mass spectrometry analysis, which shows when you look at both silicon and lithium, um, that over the course of eight weeks, you see this gradual loss of the presence of these ions from um, the implant site. What's again interesting here is when you compare the ratio of silicon to lithium, you can see that the ratio changes. There's an increase in the lithium ratio to the silicon which suggests that lithium is being released from the structure of the clay at the site, um, again indicating the potential for breakdown by the cells of these, of these clay nanoparticles at the implant site itself. We've also looked at other tissues to see whether the clay um, accumulated um, in other peripheral tissues, such as lung, heart, blood, and stomach, um, and we didn't really see any indication that it was. This is silicon in the stomach, so um, that's a, a very um, unstable signal there because of the ubiquity of silicon in, um, in the mouse's environment. Um, but when we looked at other excretory tissues like the liver and the kidney and the spleen and the bladder, uh, we did see uh, increased levels initially in the liver and then it's apparent transition to the kidney. Um, quite an interesting timeline here um, with occasional peaks in the spleen and bladder. So that's at least some indication that the, the 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 mouse was able to process and excrete via its urinary system at least some of the clay uh, but we need to do some further studies trying to track the, the full amount of clay implanted before we can fully conclude that this doesn't accumulate in other tissues okay so all of this um, indicates that the clay gels sustain localized activity of growth factors in vivo the clay gels are progressively degraded at the implant site um, and that the mouse body is able to process and degrade and clear um, the nanoclay um, from the site as well. So this, I think, provides good evidence of the potential utility of this approach for delivering a molecule like BMP2. Finally, as we finish, I just want to share some more recent work um, where we've 
tried again to harness the interesting gelation properties of the clay gel and bring them together with this protein binding activity and controlling these two things together to allow us to generate more complex pattern structures within the clay gel itself. Um, so I mentioned the fact that what we're seeing with the gelation is a diffusion gel um, mechanism. It's by the diffusion of ions and proteins into the gel that the gel stiffens and the gel network is formed. Um, um, this is work by uh, my former PhD student, now postdoc, Roxana Ramirez Sanchez. And she had the really clever idea that if you try and control the, um, this process, the diffusion of proteins and concordant with its gelation, um, we should be able to control the distribution of protein within the gel um, environment. And that's indeed what she found. She found that if you assemble the gel in different concentrations of protein, and then add load the um, gel with a subsequent wave of labeled protein, which is this bright ring here, you can very precisely actually control where that protein loads within the gel structure. Um, and this is clearly a diffusion process because when you uh, change the, the time or the, the initial assembly protein concentration, you can change the rate of this diffusion front and then the localization of this secondary wave of protein within the gel structure. And that gives you a lot of control over where the protein localizes. So using this approach, we can control the localization of protein to generate different um, gradients of different steepness and dimensions. Um, and you can even punctuate the introduction of labeled protein to generate these more complex um, punctuated gradients throughout the gel structure. And these gels are very stable. Um, and because it's a um, diffusion system, a kind of bottom-up assembly system, sorry, I jumped ahead, um, you can also scale this very easily as well because it's all about um, simply changing the order of your adding solutions to the gel structure to, to, to control where the, the protein ends up. Um, the patterning can be quite high resolution, down to about 20 microns, um, and also these gels are very, very stable. Over many months, the protein, because it's incorporated within the gel structure, uh, remains localized where it is um, and is not released over that time frame. So we've done some very initial work um, trying to see if, show the potential of this in vivo. Um, so this was a study we set up, a pilot study, where we loaded BMP2 into the gel. Um, we used a 3D printed um, holder to preserve the gel dimensions in the subcutaneous region and then looked to see whether loaded BMP2 was able to cause localized bone formation. And the initial indications are that it does. Um, we're yet to confirm whether this new bone here um, in the BMP2 sample is localized within the gel or at the edge of the gel. We suspect it actually might be the edge of the gel, but at least it provides some indication that by localizing the BMP2, you're able to control um, quite precisely where the new bone formation forms. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. In conclusion, um, what I think I've shown you is that these clay particles allow very nice self-assembly processes, which allow you to create injectable gels. Um, because of the ability of clay particles to bind protein, you have a lot of control over the subsequent templating of tissue in vivo. And I think this is a promising approach of harnessing endogenous cells in the body recruiting them and precisely controlling their, their activity within a gel environment to initiate um, controlled regenerative responses. So I'd like to thank a range of different people involved in this work. Um, in particular, um, David Gibbs was an MD working myself and Richard, and he did a lot of the background BMP2 work. Dan Page, a PhD student who did some of the skin and angiogenic work. Roxana, I've mentioned, Yang He and Mohammed did a lot of the um, cell work that I, I presented, and um, and then uh, Richard Refo and Nick, who are my long-term collaborators and mentors. Uh, we've, as as I mentioned, we've spun out um, the BMP2 fraction of this work, um, and a lot of the um, in vivo tracking work was done um, in collaboration with Renovos on an Innovate UK grant um, led by Agnieszka Janacek, shown here in the picture. So thanks very much for listening, um, and I'm really interested to hear what your questions are. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
Thank you, John, Thank you, John. for your interesting talk. Let's see if uh, somebody has the, any question. Somebody here. Uh, Jaime has a question. You can. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, very nice presentation, John. Um, a very promising present presentation. And uh, uh, and I I just I understood I understood that you are using all the time. Uh, uh, proteins, a uh, big proteins, growth factors, or or the uh, BMP uh, BMP2, which which is I think is a large protein, it's a medium large protein. About uh, uh, Using the nanoclays uh, to deliver uh, small molecules. Mm -hmm. How um, how it, the 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 uh, the research is is doing in the last in the last years about uh, the possible uh, delivery of, of small molecule with nanoclays. Uh, mm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've um, done a little bit of work on this, um, which I've not shown here, uh, but the indication is that the the small molecules will, depending on their charge. I mean. The small molecules will have a much simpler charge structure than the larger proteins, and so um, the the mode of interaction is perhaps more predictable. Um, but the, the generally we find that the drugs we load remain within the gel structure. Um, we've looked, for example, for antimicrobial applications. We've looked at chlorhexidine um, as an antimicrobial agent, and again, you find that the chlorhexidine binds and is localized within the gel. Um, actually, for antimicrobial applications, we think this isn't very useful. It'd be much nicer to have a slow release mechanism in this case. Uh, but generally, clay binding is very broad spectrum indeed. And so almost everything we throw at it seems to be um, localized. Sometimes you can control that through pH and the salt concentrations of the media. Uh, but um, yeah, but uh, generally there's there's a lot of scope there for small molecule delivery as well. What I think the main um, limitation of the approach is, is that the, the strategy is almost always, especially in with these colloidal gels, um, almost always a localization strategy. So typical drug delivery approaches will rely on the ability of the material to release these drugs, um, whereas our focus um, is on the ability of the gels to bind and retain these molecules. Uh, so I think it's well suited for regenerative medicine application where you want to generate these tissue templates, uh, but other applications where you're looking at small molecule released local tissues, um, that's more challenging. And uh, But there are other ways of doing it. So often combining the clay particles with a polymer um, will mean that you can use the clay particles as a way of modifying the release from the polymer um, of these smaller molecules. Thanks, John. Uh, just another question. Uh, I, I've seen you are incorporating uh, 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 methods to follow uh, uh, ions like ICPMS. Uh, that's mm. a very com that's very common for this kind of work. Mm. And what kind of ions are you following? Uh, so with the clay, it's um, generally silicon or lithium. Um, and, and I mean the other the other major ionic component of the clay is the magnesium. The magnesium is obviously ubiquitous in lots of biological tissues, so it's harder to track that in vivo. Uh, but silicon is very easy to track, and lithium as well. Um, there's a much much higher sensitivity of ICPMS to lithium, and so we can detect very very low quantities of of lithium. Okay, thanks. Let's see if uh, something uh, somebody else has more, uh, has more questions. <laughs> 
I have one in the meanwhile. Uh, John, uh, as you know, I'm a big cartilage fan, and I wonder if you are trying to, um, instead of BMP2 or in combination, do something like TGF beta to try to um, repair cartilage or at least osteochondral defects, combining bone and cartilage. Yeah, thank you. So this is a um, something we've been meaning to work on for a long time. Um, and we've got some, again, initial in vitro data showing you can induce chondrogenesis within the clay gels um, in response to TGF beta 3. Also, I mean, even in response to BMP2 in vivo, you get a classically endochondral um, response. So when you look at the earlier time points, you see a lot of cartilage, um, hypertrophic cartilage, which is then remodeled into bone. Um, so we know that the clay gels can host cartilage formation. In fact, that's the preferred um, direction that the BMP2 initiation takes in vivo is via the endochondral mode of bone formation. Um, so I think there's promise there. And I think specific, especially with this new approach, we've got to pattern uh, molecules within the gel structure. I think trying to target gradient tissues like endochondral, osteochondral tissue um, could be a promising way forward. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Monica Folgueira. Hi, John. Hi, hello. hello. I don't know if you remember me, but we actually met once through my. Oh, so hi, Monica. You. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> so, um, great talk. Very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting. So, my is cartilage uh, fan. Uh, I must admit, I'm not. I work uh, uh, with, in the brain. But in any case, it's really interesting talk. And I had uh, um, a few notes here. I must admit that I was multitasking during your call, you know, during <laughs> your, your you. presentation <laughs> or phone call. So I don't know if you mentioned this, but one of my questions is, um, you know, for the interaction with clay and, you know, in the bone, you have different cell types. So I didn't know if you have any idea which are the critical cell, if any, if you have... Uh, any information about that critical cell that could be more important in the degradation of the clay and uh, to liberate factors of these metals in, in clay, like yeah, osteoclast yeah. or? I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of, um, we're really interested in exploring the macrophage response to clay currently. We've just got some funding to do that in a bit more depth. Um, I think clearly these are the, cells that are going to interact with the clay first are going to be mainly responsible for clearing the clay and then mediating the invasion of, of stem cells. I mean, it's very interesting that where you're implanting this gel with BMP2 subcutaneously, um, there's not many, there's not a major um, stem cell population in the subcutaneous region. Um, and we're also not seeing much BMP2 release and yet you get this very strong ectopic bone induction response. Um, and I and so presumably it is recruitment of probably local muscle or 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 um or circulating uh, skeletal cells which which are which are around as well that become recruited into the gel. But we are pretty sure that that's mediated by the initial macrophage response. And so mm -hmm. at the moment we're trying to really try and understand um uh, and the initial inflammatory cell response, the extent to which you get this um, early inflammatory response and then um, a more of a regenerative macrophage phenotype emerging. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really a, a focus of our activities at the moment. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And and um, also another question for these metals that they get released, you know, they could interact with different um, um, enzymes, different pathways. Do you have any candidate pathway? Like, for example, I was thinking lithium and wind signaling. I don't mm. know if you know what is going on downstream or. Yeah, we've, we've looked at that. In fact, we've just um, responding to some reviewers' comments on a paper on that. Um, and we, we, so we, we don't think the lithium wind interaction plays a major role. Um, 
I mean, certainly when you apply lithium at the equivalent concentration as to cells, it doesn't activate that pathway alone. Also, wow. although you see very early upregulation of alkaline phosphatase, you don't see any activation of other key wind genes like axin 2 we've looked at, um, wow. and that's not upregulated. So, um, yeah, I, I think the, the concentrations of lithium are too low, really, to influence that pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, and I, I mean, our, our, the indication so far is that actually the ionic products of clay don't play a role. Um, mm -hmm. Where we're seeing this early osteogenic effects, um, we think it's probably more to do either with um, some effect of the clay depleting the media of various proteins and starving the cells, or mm -hmm something to do with the accumulation of clay in the cell, stressing them out. And because these are cells primed towards bone pathways, we think in this in these in vitro contexts, what we're seeing mainly is a stress response. And when you stress out osteoblasts, you get lots of mineralization, lots of collagen one, um, because that's what they know what to do. So we're, we're mm -hmm. trying to look at inter intervening stress pathway effects, which may be a possibility. Mm -hmm. the, the situation in the in vitro is very artificial because you're applying these dispersions of clay to the cells and they accumulate very, very quickly within the cells. In vivo, where the clay forms a stable gel and the stem cell response is mediated by macrophage removal of the clay, uh, we think probably there's the, the role of the BMP2 is much more important. It's in the clay is, we can see as much more of a carrier rather than playing an active role in the induction of osteogenic effects in cells. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very interesting. Okay. <laughs> very good to see you, John. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Monica. You are no big fan of the cartilage yet. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm becoming, I'm becoming through collaboration with my... <laughs> yeah. but I have to compare you to several fish as well. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the deal. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Thanks. More questions? We are a friendly face, and we are going to see a question from Edo Scarpa. Good morning, guys. I don't think I'm going to show my face because I'm still wearing a pyjama. I hope you remember me, John. No, first of all, very, very interesting as always. Um, I just have a curiosity for you. Um, as you mentioned that the clay is absorbing, um, have you thought about using it as a diagnostic tool, John? It's like if you, if basically, if you put it in, um, if you put some serum onto the clay, do you know if you have absorption of certain type of proteins from the serum and whether you can use it to compare it with, um, uh, I don't know, patients with uh, some kind of disease? Con con yeah, thanks, controls. Edo. Well, um, yeah, so of course, we've been thinking about whether we could use the properties of clay in diagnosing coronavirus. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> that obviously crossed our mind. Um, and I think, I mean, there is potential. So, I think probably the use of the clay as a coating for binding proteins, for providing catalytic um, effects through co-localization of, of molecules and that kind of thing, that's certainly a, a big area of research. And it's, um, yeah, and, and, and like other nanoparticles, clays have been explored in, in those kind of contexts. I, I think there's possibility there. I mean, my my this is really kind of outside of our particular area of expertise. Um, and the fact is, there is lots of um, there is there are lots of other groups exploring those applications of clay. But um, okay. certainly that's that's definitely a potential application. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Edo. Uh, more questions? I think uh, Jaime. No, I, I don't have questions. I just, uh, it's, 
a small uh, something that I saw in the last slide. How come you got uh, uh, a money from a, a, an oceanographic uh, um, oh. institution? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So that wasn't um, that wasn't money. That was the um, ICPMS analysis. Ah, uh, okay. That, they, yeah, they're the that. ones with the uh, the very advanced <laughs> techniques for um, just, measuring. Um, I, I saw like. that. Mm, let me see which is the relationship <laughs> with the oceanography. It's our shared interest in something that comes out of mud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right. So it seems like there are no more questions. So uh, it seems uh, it is time to uh, adjourn. So the um, thanks again, John, uh, and we will follow you uh, in the future. Uh, the people people who, who didn't know you, uh, we will follow you in the future. So we know where you are and and, and the things that you are doing, which is really great. Oh, thank okay. you very much. It's a real pleasure to be part of this event. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thanks everybody. And, uh, and we will be with you next, uh, next 20, uh, November 27th, which is going to be the, the happy hour, our happy hour. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, John and everybody. Thanks, Mike. Everyone.